Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. So today's topic is the universal motor driver, and we'll talk about some of our heavy duty robot hardware that we've just finished. Um, we have a nice turnout today. So before um, Chip and Michael get started, and this is informal, by the way, because this is very much a, a work in motion still um, software wise. So we all know that. Um, couple things here. There's a new quick bite I posted. Um, just it was a learning experience for myself where I started working with the floating point math over last weekend and um, immediately started to figure out what I need to do to display numbers. And I just thought I'd write it up. So I put it here. It's, you know, as far as floating point math goes, there's really not much here except uh, a few examples, um, which are probably very understandable to everybody, but the one I was really interested in was how to display stuff with PSD. So this will probably be helpful. Um, Johnny Mac had a nice method and he showed me how to use it. And the code is available for download at the bottom of that page. And I just pasted that in too. So feel free to post any comments about what you like or don't like on that page. And this actually restarts the creation of quick bytes too which we've had a long break from. Um, Propeller Tool 2.62 is actually released. This is 2.61. Uh, when I was using 2.62 last weekend, we found a few issues with um, absence of syntax highlighting for the new floating point stuff. And so Jeff is working on that. And then he said he'll have another version out, 2.63, like in about a week or so. So all the floating point works, but the highlighting is not all there. So for someone like me, it's like, does it work or not work? <laughs> but it did work. And then today we're talking about this and a whole bunch of stuff that goes with it. So that you have the links handy if you want to go look at the actual products. I'm just gonna do a massive paste in the chat right now. Boom, that's there. So this is a motor driver board. And I think it's, I misspelled weight, whoops. Um, I think the product is actually available for order now. And if not, you could just click on the wait list and then you can get it when it comes available. So we have P2 chips and this has been important to a number of customers who've replied to us lately on this thread. And thanks for to all of you who replied here also and told us to finish the documentation. We got the message. <laughs> That's our priority too now, and always was. Uh, this guy, P2 Edge with 32 megabytes of RAM. We are running low. We have 20 left. And I was also going to provide an inventory update on the P2 EC up until 20 minutes ago. We had 180, and those are all sold. And we are actually 450 upside down. So there's going to be a little bit of a shortage of these and I don't tell you to cause a just gonna do a little mute on safe mode there. I don't tell you this to cause a, a feeding frenzy, but just to let you know as our as our insiders in case you need to get a few of these, get them now because uh, you won't be able to get them for a while. And I don't know how long a while is. This was planned for next Wednesday and Francesco has asked for a delay. Um, which we will definitely do, no problem. So we're waiting just to get a few more things together and we'll restart this presentation. So if you signed up, I will, you'll see a cancellation come from Zoom. No big deal there. Um, he just needs more time. However, because of that one um, being planned on next Wednesday, I had rescheduled Jeff his documentation update for Thursday. So I think what we'll do is we'll just keep Jeff on Thursday and we probably won't have a meeting on Wednesday next week. That's okay with everybody. And then going way forward um, in February, we'll have Eric here to talk about everything with FlexProp. And this is cool. I just ran my code from this weekend in FlexProp and it worked just the same as in Propeller Tool, even with debug. And I haven't followed all the discussion online, but he has debug enabled in a menu in FlexProp. Very cool. Good job, Eric. I know you aren't here, but great work. We appreciate what you're doing. And looking way forward in mid-February, 
Um, this is planned. Jeff still has a lot, to, a lot of work to do. So when we planned it, it was actually months ago. We'll see if we keep this on the schedule. And um, we're also going to talk about P2P2 again, but Stephen and I may supplant this with another interesting topic. So more on that later. And with that, yeah. Chip, want to talk about motors? Let's see here. I've got this these boards now. We had took us a while to get it right. We twice we installed the uh, diodes backwards, and this was causing us lots of trouble. So anyway, we've got that straightened out. So this thing is super robust now. It can run. Uh, Michael's running it at sixty volts. So this, it's we're specking it at forty, but at sixty it was fine. Nothing got destroyed except almost his knees. He had a uh, vice on his table and that thing was, we, we wound up the motor to 50 kilometers per hour and that was like 30 miles an hour. And I didn't even know it could go that fast, but you can't, of course, start it that way. You have to ramp it up. There's a lot of inertia involved. So the motor board's working great. And now uh, I've just been working on an algorithm uh, for the feedback, you know, based what amounts to the PID loop to be able to handle the motion. Um, the PID thing kind of tripped me up for a while. I was implementing it and I had to like throw the theory out the window and just think practically like, what does it take to do this? So I have what is like a PID, maybe without the D, which often gets discarded in uh, motion control systems because it tends to step input responses, create jerks on the output. So it's kind of like a proportional integral. Uh, the integral is, the, is by far the main uh, factor in the output. So the D uh, means discard? I think so. For us, it, for me, it did. Um, but anyway, I've got it working now. So it, it can um, handle, it, it can run the power up and down. So what you do is you give it a rate and you can modify the rate. And uh, it will make sure it'll, you know, how do we say this? Kind of revolve the, um, the three phases. And in, in, in the case of this, this bigger, uh, let me see if you can see this, this hoverboard wheel, there's like uh, 90 steps in a revolution. There's 15 phase revolutions per, well, there's 15 revolutions of phase, excuse me, a whole resolution of phase per 15 degrees here. Okay, so, and is that right? No, it's, let's see, we've got, well, hold on, I'm sorry, my math is all jumbled up. I know it's 90 steps around and it's six steps. So it's 1 15th of a rev revolution. And then uh, let's see, 360 divided by 15 is 24. Okay, so there's 24 phase resolutions in a wheel revolution. Does that make sense? So if I, if I run the three phases through a whole cycle, this will move 1 15th of a revolution, or no, a 24th of a re revolution, which is 15 degrees. Okay, so the way we're controlling this motor, Doug here and I talked about this a lot, is we're giving it basically a, a target phase, okay? And our phase can vary by about, mind you, there are six steps in a, in a whole revolution of phase for the Hall effect sensor. So that's 60 degrees per Hall effect step, right? So what we have here is a phase that we're controlling it with. And then we have an algorithm which simply puts it at that phase and then ramps up the power as need be or lets it down as need be in order to keep the phase error within a range of I think about uh, plus minus 30 degrees, or is it plus minus 15 degrees? I'll show you on the display here in a minute. Um, but anyway, my thought at first was to just give the motor a command and have it do it in as long as it takes to get the command done. But Doug pointed out that when you're coordinating different servos, you cannot have them just you know work until they get the job done because their relative positions matter the entire time. So what you have to do is come up with like, he said the way um, Alan Bradley does it is they'll have like a movement plan. Like these are five millisecond steps. Here's 
zero milliseconds, five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and they'll coordinate all the servos like this and then move them in lockstep. So the job of the low level driver is to keep the motor at the proper phase and accumulate entire, accumulate the Hall effect steps too, of which there are going to be 90 per whole wheel revolution. But mainly we're just locking the phase. So we modulate the power up and down and we move the phase. So what happens is you have the phase turning and then its amplitude is the amount of power required to keep the error within spec. And if we ever get, if the error ever goes too far out, then I just set a fault flag and uh, the high level driver can go, oh, a fault occurred, which means that we slipped enough that we're no longer certain we're tracking the motor. So you kind of have to design things so that, you know, you're not gonna have faults because to recover from a fault, there's a little bit of ambiguity about, uh, you have the Hall effect steps, right? But they're only a 90th of a revolution. So I'll run this thing here. Let me get this. Actually, at this point, at this moment, I have this little motor connected right here. Let me get the camera down here. Okay. And this motor is kind of hard to see. Maybe I can switch over to this, this little documentation thing. And then I'll share my screen. Okay, let me switch cameras. Uh, let's see, here we go. Okay, there, we can see this now. Um, you can see that shaft on there, right? Just to clarify, Chip, is it a brushless DC or a gear yeah, motor? This is a brushless DC motor with a gearbox. Okay. So this part back here is the brushless DC motor. So it's got three big wires coming off of it right here which are the high current wires that run the, uh, the electromagnets. And we got five little wires, which are running the Hall effect sensor. And that thing goes back to the board like this. Is that all upside down? Yeah. Yeah, I was standing on my head, now I'm not. Okay, so there I, I just kind of made some connector and it, it goes in where the Hall effect goes. And then we're using the first three channels, U, V and W, we're not using X. I've got like, I can run like, you know, put 20 volts into this thing. So now if we look at the motor, I'll run the code and show you the code. So, okay, whoops, hey, focus. You got a piece of tape you can put on the shaft? Um, if not, it's okay. I, I do somewhere in this room. Yeah, don't bother. You will see it. Okay. Uh, you know, why is this all scratchy looking? This is writing to me, but it looks like on the video, it's just all pocky looking. Oh, they're probably because my window's under sampling. It's like skipping every end sample. Okay, so I'm gonna download this code now and run it. All right, so you can see it's, it's winding up and it's gonna ramp down. then it's gonna turn around and go the other direction. So without any mechanical load, you can kind of push the envelope on the acceleration and deceleration. So now it's going the other way, right? So you can see this pattern. So if I reorient this little camera to my screen, hold on here. Maybe I should just share my screen. That'd probably be better. Let's see here. There we go. Uh, this is all we need. I can take this out of here. We don't need that. Okay, so you see this green in this box right here where it says error? Because here's kind of a tricky thing about running these Hall effect feedback motors. You only have, if you have six steps and 360 degrees, you only have 60 degree resolution for where you're at, which of course you have like way finer resolution on your phase that you're controlling the motor with, right? Which is up here. So you have to kind of pick a knee point in the feedback that's going to be matterful. So I found that uh, I'm resolving this down to like seven bits of error 
So it's actually signed, okay? So it's, it's seven F up here, 127 and minus 127 down there. Oh, you can't see me pointing, but. Um, so you, you can see that when it goes one direction, the error is below zero. When it goes the other direction, the error becomes above zero. And uh, what it's doing is it's, it's looking, it's making the decision by asking, are we, are we two, two uh, Hall effect steps off? That's the point at which it decides to give, it, to give the uh, power negative or positive feedback, or excuse me, whether to increment or decrement the power. And uh, it, you can't get much tighter than that because it becomes really OCD and becomes too obsessive because remember, you're, you're, you're very coarse on your Hall effect step. There's 60 degrees, right? So I'm making the decision point at around 120 degrees is my limit. So between 60 and 120 degrees, um, I decide to go up or down. So what I do is I wind up constraining the error but I can't let it be too loose because then it will, it'll fault out. And if I'm too tight, it'll just take too much current all the time. So does it make sense how this error is like above the middle? Then it, when we switch direction, it goes below the middle. And then down here, the red, this is the power. And we're only going, this thing's only probably drawing about at full speed maybe like 100 milliamps or something. It's pretty, pretty light. So I'll turn, let's see, I'll cancel this and then about the code here. Turn that off for a minute. So in my main loop up here, this is it. Um, I'm updating my scope displays, waiting half a millisecond. Here I detect the fault. I, I check to see, I don't fault out early because remember when we first start the motor, we don't know what position it's in. So we've got to give it a little time to lock onto the phase. Uh, but that could be improved by looking at the initial phase of the motor and setting the phase to that initial value. So here, I, this is my logic for the, um, for the fault. I just stop the cog that's running the motor controller and. Uh, make the pins low, just stop everything. I reset them and just go into an infinite loop. Uh, and then here's some more stuff where I update uh, the position text box and then the, uh, what is R? Uh, this, the, one of the scopes. And then here's really, this is really all that's happening decision, well, not decision wise, but as far as controlling the motor loop, it's just right here. So I'm, I'm doing a big, sign and this thing returns like uh let's see this is the max value i think no 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 no. this is the rate this constitutes the angle so i'm incrementing the angle each time through the loop this is the power level or the the uh, hypotenuse let's say and this means just use 32 bits so it's a full 32 bit angle that's why i have to add such a large number to it to get it to go so what's happening is this is like a very low frequency oscillator, right? Goes up, comes back down, goes negative, spends some time down there, comes back up. So that's, that's why the motor is slowly going forward, then reverse, forward, reverse. So I, I put the, uh, the rate control, I mean, the, the rate adding down into the low level driver, but I don't know if that's really the best place for it because really what the low level driver is good at is just locking the phase and controlling the power so that you're always within you know, an error and it can ramp the power up and down. Um, I think, any questions? Chip, question from Bill. Would using sensorless drive techniques improve the Hall effect error control? It could, yes. I don't have a handle on field-oriented control yet. Um, but yeah, in theory, that we, we could resolve much better than 60 degree steps per phase or per um, phase resolution. Remember, there are many phase resolutions in a wheel res revolution. And I think we've gone over this driver somewhat in the past, but in the loop, we measure all the ADCs and then we calculate uh, 
the power to, to, draw, to output the drive signals. The, um, this little section here, it reads the Hall effect sensor and then updates the position. And the way it, it see it grabs the W pin, the V pin and the U pin, rotates them into this Hall underscore and then uh, masks the value right here so that you have the, the three LSBs are new and the next three LSBs up are the old. So you have 64 combinations and then it looks that up in this deltas table. And the deltas table is right here. Okay, so based on new versus old, these are the deltas that can occur in the position. Um, okay, so then down here, so we add once we look about once we look at that zero or plus minus one, we add it to the position, and that gets reported back to the driver. So then here is where this is like the complex part. This is all there is really to it. Uh, no, wait, excuse me. This determines the error. So this looks at the hall sensor, figures out uh, which direction we're going, and then looks up hall angles. So depending on uh, whether we're going forward or reverse, we either use you know, the top half of this table or the bottom half if we're reverse. And so these are the Hall effect codes that come out. And then these are the 32-bit angles. Like three frac six is 80,000 thousand hexadecimal, big 32-bit number, one half basically. And then this is one six. So these are the angles. So if you're going forward, this is what the angle means. If you're going backwards, uh, this is what it means. So what we do is we get uh, a 32-bit angle, which is really only one of six. One of six. It's 60-degree differences among these. And uh, we then subtract from that our uh, Let's see, our rate, let's see, not the rate. What am I doing here? We get the hall. Oh, right here, it goes into S. We look up our angle, and then we ultimately do it, we subtract from our actual, the angle that we're outputting in the power. Okay, uh, and then we shift it right 24 bits to make basically a signed eight bit number, and then we uh, clear off that one bit that I had set for the lookup down here. Um, so what this gives us now is a, is a signed 8-bit number that above or below zero determines how much error we have relative to what we're outputting to the motor. Then down here, this is, this is, the, this is what I meant to say is the, is the more complex part. Here we check to see if the error, is it near the edge? We absolutize it. So it's going to be plus minus 127 at that point. And we ask, is it above 120? If it's 120 or above, then we're probably faulting because we're getting the error is getting so big that soon we won't detect it because we will, we will have you know, gone around a revolution. We don't want to do that. So at this point, we signal to the, to the top level driver that we have a problem, we faulted. But in any case, we keep running the thing. So here's, here's like the entire PID loop, if you can call it a PID loop. I mean, it's got elements of everything but D in it. So 43 is our, out of eight bits, 43 is our need. So if we take 43 divided by 128, that's about a third, it's 0.344. So let's just say it's a third. So what we're looking at, we're saying, are we two steps beyond where we, where our power output is at? Because if we're two steps, see, we're never going to be within one step because we can't resolve less than one step on the Hall effect. But we can use two steps out as our decision point because we're going to always be ideally between one and two steps, really between zero and two. But we can't. We have to throw away that first one because it's too coarse. So we're saying, are we one or two steps away? And so by subtracting 43, remember here we made it absolute, take away 43, now we have a positive or a negative number. And then because we set C here, C is gonna be one if we, if we underflow and we have a negative number. 
it's going to be positive if we have a uh, if we have you know a need for more power. If if we're if we're, our error is above forty three, then this N C case will be true. So what we do then, since X is a signed number. And the, and the magnitude of X is proportional to our error. If we want to add power, we just shift it right by one. But if we take away, we want to shift it right by four. So what you see here is that when it needs more power, it gets that more easily than it backs the power down. So we add that to the power and then we limit it. We, we make sure that it's not going to exceed our max power or drop too low because if we let the power go to zero, It'll often fault when you try to restart the motor after spinning it. And then here we just report back. So really, this is aside from just the rudimentary measurements and outputting, this is the, the this is really the, the heart of the driver. It just modulates the power to keep the error in bounds. That's all it does. It's that that code does all that work. And that's everything else in this big loop is just to facilitate generating the PWM, the angles, but this is the whole, the only feedback. So the only feedback we really have is, is our power. So we ramp the power up and down to keep our error within, within limits that make sense. Any questions on this thing from anybody? Sorry, I talked so long. I know I put some of you guys to sleep. So low level or high level questions, Chip? Anything. This is the low level here. Right. This is this really constitutes the PID loop, right? This code right here. So, so scooching back up in this code to uh, what you called the the line of code that was really driving the motor. It was just this, rate. this right here. Everything else is reporting or detecting a fault. So this just updates the uh, the Hall effect state window. This does one of the scopes. This detects the fault and shuts down. This does some more reporting of data, but really this is the main thing in the loop. So, so moving that, that rate command, that line of code to something that um, can become speed, distance, steps, et cetera. Is that where you're headed? Well, yeah, this is, okay. I'm at the point now I realize that Okay, we need a we need like another layer of control on this whole thing, which could be done in the assembly language driver. But the trouble is, it's like an animal that you got to grab either by the ears or by the tail or by the shoulders. And by doing one thing, you give up control over others. Like, let's say that we we just feed it like, okay, we're going to go and make a move. And uh, here's the acceleration that you can use to ramp the speed up and down. Here's the max speed you can give it. And I need you to go from A to B. So what it'll do is it can compute a path and go from A to B, but who knows how much time that takes, right? Because it's all, it all kind of happens over time. And it's all a function of like the acceleration limits that you gave. And so that's one way to control the motor. You can, you can meet your you know, transpositional goal, but you don't know how much time it's going to take. Now, the other way to do this is to say, I want to go from A to B in this amount of time. And then maybe with some setting, like, you know, what's the max acceleration I can use, the driver can use, then it can ramp the motor up and down and arrive there on time and not exceed any kind of acceleration limit. So that's another method of control, right? Uh, so one is, is kind of like uh, goal oriented with, with acceleration and speed limitations. The other is uh, time controlled with some acceleration limit that you'd need to apply to, to specify. But then that's in both those cases, those are kind of good for controlling one motor. But what if you have two motors on a robot chassis, right? At that point, you need to kind of do what, um, what Alan Bradley does and come up with like, a, I forget what Doug called this. It's like a movement plan or something where at each point in time, like they do five millisecond increments, you have to decide what, are, what do the positions of my motors need to be at these time junctures? So it's almost like you, 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 you could play a recording out 
of simply phase information and have the low level driver make sure that it you know, moves the motor, keeps the air in check. And that way you could coordinate, like let's say you have an XY gantry. You can't, you can't run the X independent of the Y because they often need to move together. Like if you're gonna make a circular pattern, right? Can't just run one and not the other. They have to be moving in time in a coordinated fashion. So in those cases, I'm kind of thinking that the way the high level driver kind of needs to be, is it sort of choreographs the motor movement and then you have, and, and by doing so, it has to take responsibility for what the max acceleration are and what the top speeds are going to be. And then it, but it gets to control everything that way. But if I just, if, if we give it, if we make the driver do like go from A to B in this time or go from A to B using these limitations, it can do it. You can control speed or time, but you can't control, you can only, you have to pick between time and speed control. But if you're going to coordinate multiple motors, then you kind of need to break free from that and then take charge of choreographing all the motors movements by just simply have, and all you have to do is change the phase of each in time. And then the low level driver will keep the motor where it needs to be at all times and then fault out if, if the goals weren't met. So I don't, so I was, you know, I've been thinking about this last day and a half and it's kind of a problem of not just where to cut the pie but what should the pie look like and i'm kind of thinking now that if that what we're going to need is some kind of but let the low level driver handle the motor interaction modulate the power keep the motor in check but coordinate the movement at some kind of a higher level and people who've done cnc work you could probably say now like there's probably, I'm sure this is a problem many people have faced before and they've come up with solutions. Some of you, you know, on this meeting probably have some ideas. And if you want to express them, go ahead. Cause I'm kind of like uh, a little, not, I'm just kind of in a, a lull right now because I don't know which, which way to take the driver to make it, you know, do something sensible that a customer would expect. Um. <laughs> Shift. This is a this is a single motor control. If you have a platform, you're going to be driving a pair of these. So wouldn't the wouldn't the motion be drive forward, drive backward at a certain rate for each wheel? Ye yes, but think about this. And, and rate could have some sort of power implication, strength of yep. effort. Yeah. Okay, so you said think of this. Well, okay, say that you got, say that you're, let me get my, um, my camera back to my face here. So right now it's pointing at a blank screen. Uh, you're still screen sharing code. Yeah, I'll have to stop that, I guess. Oh, wait, now here I go. Uh, okay. Hold on, here we go. All right, you can, should be able to see me now, okay. So imagine that you want the robot, you've got two wheels. Say these are wheels, right? Right. You want it to turn and then go forward. Right. Right. So let's let, take, take this guy right here, this guy. He's going to go like this. He's gonna, and then he's going to go like this. So what happens is. So you're changing the rate on one of them to cause the turn. Yes. And then you're starting up the other one from, from a, a, a stopped position. So what happens is. It's not about going from A to B because when you land at B, you probably have a rate that you don't want to, you might want to alter it or you might want to leave it the same. So, what has, so you always have to know what you're going to do in the future. You can't just say go A to B and the other one go A to B. Even if you tell them at the same time, you, everything's kind of like start and stop before you do a new thing. Like you'd have to, oh. you'd have to go like this and then turn them both on to go that way. Uh, Chip, Chip, were you going to switch cameras? We're still looking at your screen. Yeah, unless oh, yeah. unless okay. in, ends your right. video. There you go. Yeah, and so um, that's what I was thinking. You're thinking point to point movement, and I'm thinking more like accelerometers and brakes. 
Yes. Uh, accel acceleration pedals and brakes. And so you have uh, the difference is you have two different motors. And so you have intent what you want for motion. And then your motor should just track how we're meeting intent is what I'm thinking. You're driving. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I've thought about yeah, this. You know, what you could do right now, I'm feeding it a rate, right? It's it's changing the angle through time. Right. And then it's right. keeping the motor synced up. Well, I could uh, go a little further. And then rather than just specify rate, I could specify purely acceleration. Right. Right. That gets and, added and, to the rate, which gets added to the angle. Right. And then acceleration That's, is impacted by your slope, your climb, or descent. You mean if you're physically going up a hill? Correct. Yes. Because now, if you want to maintain a stable speed, you've got to have something to counter your downhill or counter your uphill. Well, yeah, it'll do that. If, if you're dictating, I mean, if you have a control loop that's dictating the phase at all moments, right? What each motor's at. Then right. it'll it'll keep them locked. The question is, do you have enough power to make the motor turn in time to not to stay locked? Fault? Right to stay locked. Right. Yeah. If you so, exceed your power capability, then you just lose lock. Wait, say that again. If you exceed the power needed to drive at fixed rate, you lose lock. Right. Right. Yeah. Or you run out of power, your batteries die. <laughs> yeah, you you would lose lock. But see there, but. Yes, and there's another idea there that you could like, okay, well, let's um, let's accept that we're going to have to slow down because we're at max power and we're not meeting our goal. So slow down the rate of change. Slow down the phase. Yeah. Um, I call off safety committee today. Wait, was that a question? What? No, I did some muting. Carry on. Okay. okay. <laughs> so if we do a double integration where we give it an acceleration, so then we control the accelerator pedal, right? Right. And so what we're doing is we're, we're controlling the value that gets added to the rate that gets added to the phase. Right. And so now, now when you want to start playing, you have an accelerator pedal, but you also have, if you're trying to add mechanisms under these wheels, you're going to want to limit the behavior of acceleration, I suspect, so that you don't yes. drive the wheels under, out from under the mechanism right. and flip the thing over, right? And the same thing with stopping power. And so in my mind, those are the kind of things I think about. Why do I think this way? I drive an EV. And, oh, so, yeah. and so it's fundamentally the same thing. Your acceleration is phenomenal. For your benefit of your passengers and the packages you're carrying, you don't want to have maximum acceleration available because they'll be in the back <laughs> or yeah. slam against the windshield for braking. And so you have things like that that you got to pay attention to and control. And so I'm thinking if you've got a driver that can handle this much power and this much torque, then maybe your feed, your inputs to this thing are your acceleration limits, your acceleration rate, and this kind of stuff to now give us the ability to put this under a mechanism and have good control over it without toppling. Um, I think your distance and are you achieving your distance is when you start adding more sensors to your robot platform. So we can sense where it is, either GPS or sonar or whatever you wanna do or LIDAR, whatever then you can start measuring and countering, you know, how fast are you getting there? Did you, are you hitting things? Are you, but that doesn't need to be motor driver. Right. Another, another thing to think about is whether or not you want this to be like a, a programmable platform, you know, tell the robot like a, like a Roomba to, to go around your room or dynamic, like a hoverboard where it's a, a user is controlling it live. In the case of a user controlling it live, obviously you're not going to be trying to pre-compute what it's going to take to get to a certain point. You're just throttling up and throttling down and also whatever is involved in uh, keeping the user balanced. Yeah. Or even if it's a, a self-balancing robot, what that as well. Yes, and that's, that's just a different type of sensor. Instead of sensing location, you're sensing attitude of the platform itself. And so now you're reacting to attitude changes of the platform to keep it upright. Right. right, but now now you got you have um, an, an interaction between a sensor suite and the driver. 
Yes. And it's the question is how tightly coupled are the should these be? Do we want them as separate things that then we, a user comes in and writes some sort of binding application between them, or is it going to be a full suite of tools at the at the low level? Yeah, that's the I question. Would... Is, is there? Yeah, their whole. We're at the point where we have to like pick a methodology because right. I think the the bottom level thing is okay, but if in the case of like a hoverboard. You may not be able to do, I mean, you have a lot of inertia, right? Someone's standing on it and it requires a lot of torque to move that thing. So you kind of would have to, in some cases, if they give you a, a command to go forward and you can't do that, then you'd have to like slow down the, 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 the rate of angle change in order for your maximum power to get any movement out of it. Right. And then, so this is, this is why I'm postulating these ideas of control, and thank you for bringing the self-controlled and, and balancing into perspective. Um, project, the, the, the learning over doing lots of projects is, for me, that unless I do a first implementation of something on top, my underlying pieces are not don't end up being rich enough. I don't have to do the only implementation but I'm gonna do an example implementation so I know what's needed underlying. And so an example balancing robot, an example uh, direction given robot and putting in the control mechanisms so both work well seem to be your next projects because then you can see why isn't my motor driver doing what I need in this particular case and you can add the feature set to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, I would suggest a reference implementation or a prototype implementation of each of those forms and pick the sensors that are easiest and cheapest to use. Um, and so uh, you're, we have click modules that are nine DOF um, and you wanna create a mass, a little bit of mass on top that can be you're sitting on top of the two wheels and then add the, the, the three axis motion and, and gyroscope and stuff and now keep that thing balanced. Uh, that's real trivial code, real trivial hardware to add to your platform that, with which you can drive. You just have to have sufficient mass on there so there's something the board knows how to do. It'll also give you the chance to drive twin motors if you want to do balancing on twin motors. Um, then the direction things with sensors, you've also got in the parallax store, um, uh, the, the sonic sensors and GPS sensors, and you've got other sensors that you could use to the platform, and they just create it. Um, you have robot platforms as well, but um, where you're trying to put together the two-wheel kit and the casters, so having that as your platform and then some sort of directional sensing, so you can give it mapping, maybe even cameras or whatever you want, or mapping with sonar is just fine, but have it find walls and go to walls or something like that. Um, without toppling and without bumping. Um, and so obstacle avoidance and route. So doing those kind of reference platforms in my mind would give you an, a chance would give you a chance to, if someone was to do this kind of thing with a large scale or smaller scale or a different form than what we chose as a prototype, your underlying drivers would have all the features that we need because you already tried it. Yes. Yeah, you know, I wonder though, the underlying driver's job is to keep, well, you, it can be done a few ways. Um, you can keep it with an error, which is what you'd want to do if you're running like a CNC machine with some XY gantry, right? You have to make sure things are, that each motor you're controlling is staying within an error range. Something like a hoverboard though is like, it's all kind of like, um, you push as hard as you can, but you can't guarantee anything at all because the user's brain becomes the feedback loop, you know, but, but he might give you a forward command. So you go forward as hard as you can until he's, well, increasingly hard until he says, okay, that's enough. And he tilts the other way. Your command is the tilt of your platform relative to horizontal, right? Yes. And so the, the, the higher the angle of tilt, the more acceleration you expected and either reverse or forward. Right. Yeah, and you know- oh, You're just thing. melting, you're just measuring delta of tilt and then trying to determine what to do from that. Yes. 
But you know, to, to do that could be really simple because you could simply look at the Hall effect sensor and know whether you want to go forward or reverse, what pattern to apply to the electromagnets. And so it, it's, uh, it's going to result in coarser movements, but that kind of comes out in the feedback system where you've got someone 150 pounds standing on the hoverboard, right? It's not going to be noticed. But what we're doing right now, we're controlling like, you know, we're able to move the motor, let's say from here to here is one Hall effect step. Right. And we don't know where we are in there, but over time, we're gracefully passing through at a known rate all those interstitial points from one hall setting to the next. And so we know what our trajectory is. Whereas if you just do the feedback where you look at the hall effect and go, okay, this is where we're at. Do we want to go forward or reverse? Then apply A or B recipe to the coils. Mm -hmm. And so you, also, you also have the the uh, to reinterpret the amount of tilt from horizontal, you yeah. have to throw the board out from under me or keep me on top of it. Amount of tilt, right? That you have to worry about in terms of velocity, ending velocity. Yeah, and see what you could do in that case. You could just use okay, depending on where whether we need to go forward or backwards. That's based on the tilt, and then the amount of tilt says how much power to use forward and backwards. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm having you. Yep. Yeah. See, yep. that's a that's a different kind of that's a whole different kind of control loop than coordinating, you know, motors on like a CNC machine or something. Because Correct. Correct. Just, because you're not targeted. You're not targeted durations. It, you're, exactly, you're, not, yeah. you're not locked in time to certain goals. Correct. Correct. But that's what I'm saying. Now you've got the you've got the amount of desired amount of change and the direction of change, right, coming at you, and that tells you the two kind of controls you need for controlling your driver. So yeah. each application gives you a, a different kind of controls. Each prototype application kind of gives you a different kind of controls, a set of controls, and and your driver should be the the aggregate of the different kind of controls you need for the different types of platform styles. Yes. So yeah. a CNC would be one, a tilt platform would be another, and then, you know, a robot yeah, they're, they're, gets somewhere, it could be a mix of the two, who knows? Yeah, and then they're totally different approaches too, because see, if you're doing the hoverboard thing, like, okay, which direction are we gonna, are we gonna energize the coils and then to what degree with power, that doesn't, that, there's no like PLL involved in that. But if you're doing movements where you're moving in time, you're, you're, you're gracefully moving around this unit circle, but you're only hitting waypoints. Here's a Hall effect sensor. Here's one, here's one, here's one. But meanwhile, you know that you're gracefully moving through. So that's gonna be important for like a, a CNC operation, but for a hoverboard where it's all about feedback, that's inside the brain of it. go to Fieldsville or whatever, at your creek, or is that later? <laughs> <laughs> So it's going to uh, be, I'd, I'd say, pick a target platform, build a small one and go. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, the hoverboard thing is, is mindless because there's only two things like it's just direction and power. That's all you care about. Well, I have something a little more mindless than that in mind, Chip. <clears throat> uh, something yeah. just like this, the most yes. primitive, basic two motor robot. And That's what much really more like complex to... than the hoverboard. You think? Yes. Huh. Why do you think so? That's interesting. Why do you think so? Because, okay, here you have some sort of like mutual effect from both motors that you have to, that you have to put into a feedback loop. And you would like those motors. Let's say one motor is having a real, you're telling both motors to go forward. One motor starts to have a hard time. So the other motor goes faster. Well, it's turning the thing, but you don't want it to turn. So you have to now, uh, you know, back off on the motor that will move forward too easily until you get the power up to move them both in, tan in tandem. So and what I'd like to do- You don't have the same effects on your hoverboard because you don't want to ar be arbitrarily turning. Well, on the hoverboard, you do have separate left and right controls, right? Or is it just weight distribution? 
Well, that's what it, yeah, it's from, it's from, well, it doesn't know weight distribution. You're left to right. All it knows is the angle you're putting your feet at. You're assuming a split platform. What if it's a single platform and with just weight sensing? Well, the, well, the, the user... Also, the, there's also the mono wheel where it's basically just one wheel and you stand on yes. either side of it. Yes. Right. Right. I cannot there, even there it's actually more. Tilt. There, there it's actually tilt that you're dealing with. So we're, we're talking about sensors and feedback that exists on the hoverboard, but what I'd like to do, and a lot of people like to do, is just be able to give a speed and direction and a ramp to your driver yes. yeah. well, and have it take care of the dirty work initially. And then later, what we'd really like is to be able to give a distance per wheel with ramping control and let your driver take care of all the dirty right. work. But Okay, but understand the hoverboard is beautiful because the human brain standing on top of it's completely controlling the direction of the motors and the power of the motors. If you have enough sensor, yes. Well, I don't even, yeah, all you need to know is the angle of each, right? Like if you do this, it means go forward. This means slow down. And if you stand that way, it'll start backing up. This means turn one way, this means turn another. If you have but a split board, yes. Your brain does all the feedback in that loop. It's actually a simple thing. But moving the motor, let's say the motor's on a bit of a slant well, going sideways, it's going to want to list unless you phase lock both motors. I think your challenge, Chip, in, in that case, you say it's simple and the brain is doing all the control. If you, if you don't provide the right scale for tilt forward to level, uh, tilt forward to level to tilt back, you, you either provide too little range of control over speed or too much range of control and you can't stay on top of the board. So you've got an effort algorithmically to provide a controllable amount of scaling yeah. to get that working. So there is some really interesting math in there to get that proportionally correct so it's usable. And the same is gonna be true for the robot stuff as we're trying to move around. Well, yeah, now see, let's say you're on a hoverboard, right? And you start, and let's say you're at some, you're, you're at a you're at a, a, a sideways on an incline. You're traversing. Yeah. You go forward. Um, there's going to be a tendency if this motor gets ahead, it's going to want to start going downhill. But Correct. what the brain's going to do, the guy standing on the hoverboard is going to adjust his feet ever so slightly, just like you do when you're riding a bicycle, and he's going to take care of that problem. And the hoverboard doesn't have to be that smart at all because the brain is doing all that work. Whereas if we have like this two-wheeled robot and, and if, if, we, if we phase lock the motors and just you know fault if we get an, an error, then that's easy. It's always going to do what, what we think. But if we, let's say it has to go up a steep hill and it can't, it, it just, there's a limit to how fast it can go up the hill. It can't go the speed up the hill, which you'd like for it to go. So it would cause a fault. So what you're gonna to have to do then is give it power, but back off on your timing expectation. So it starts to have to become the brain. I mean, your, your higher level code has to start acting like the brain. It sounds like it still needs sensory input to give you good, to make good decisions. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and, and your brain will make up all kinds of compensations. Like if you're if you're kind of on a traverse, you're traversing a, something that's tilted, and that thing would have a tendency to want to go downhill. Well, you're just going to automatically like put a little more pressure on the you know tilt the right foot a little further, back off on the left foot, just just like you would on a bike without even thinking about it. Sure, sure. But without but with the program making all those decisions, it has to take the place of the brain. Because see, the guy riding the hoverboard, he's always adapting his expectations for what's going to happen based on what the hoverboard can do, mm -hmm. right? So back, to, back to Ken's suggestion then, what's the minimum viable for you to get good information relative to how should I make this driver usable? It's, I suspect it's not just a pair of wheel, controllable wheels. I suspect you're going to need some sort of sensory as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess what would be good is like a vector-based system, you know, like where you have direction and angle. So you could say, okay, without any, any net forward or back movement, 
I want to change my angle. Right. And I want to, and then I want to go forward where it's coordinated with both wheels. So you're suggesting that we probably need accelerometers at least, or gyros. Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, if, if you know where you want to go, you can do an inertial just by sensing what the motors by accumulating what the motors have been doing. Yeah, yeah, you can you can accumulate. Yeah, you you can get a handle on, you know, where they're at and how fast. I mean, you, you can control that. You can if you simply control the phase at all times, knowing that a three hundred sixty degree phase resolution revolution is going to be one fifteenth of a wheel revolution, right? If you know that. And you just simply give it phase data, you know, a thousand times a second, it'll it'll move everything in coordinated fashion. But and this so, is also saying that you want to construct your driver to be a sensor as well. You need feedback from your driver so the upper level control can tell how much you've accumulated so it can make IMU based decisions. Yes. Okay, so there's more additional feedback just by thinking through this and how you shape your driver. So if I was to ask your driver right now, how far have you gone? What methods would you provide to get, let me do that? Oh, well, right now it just tells you position, but remember that two motors together can turn 180 degrees and go the other way. So it's not a matter of encoder counts. I think it has to be steered with some kind of vector vector basis oh well, here's what i'm saying though if you have a control that says reset reset what you know about your position this is known this is known oriented i'm sitting here fixed facing north whatever you don't know direction or anything but you say zero yourself here from that from every movement you do forward you should be able to provide i've gone this far with each wheel or i've gone this far with this wheel right each driver Yep. Then something at the upper level can say, okay, based on this far, the spread of my wheels, based on my rotation rates, I can tell, I can calculate that I've gone this distance with each wheel, my orientation should now be, right? Right. The driver had to provide that feedback and an ability to reset. Yes. That so it's two things. And I think, I mean, if you think about it, you want the robot to be able to go up, turn this way around. Those are everything it's going to do is really basically vector based movement, right? But right. as you're moving, you have to be doing a lot of polar to Cartesian conversions and accumulating those results to know where you are on the greater X and Y plane. Yes, of course. But that's not the motor driver's responsibility. That's upper level decision stuff, right? So yeah. the the driver has to has the driver has to be controllable, and it has has to provide sensory information, so that upper level routines can be created to interpret what the motor driver is telling you. So if you think about if you think about functional decomposition, how much of the hoverboard, or I'm going back to that example for a minute because I think there's more you can do there too how much of the hoverboard is actually tracked, the positional information such as tilt is actually tracked inside the motor driver? I think nothing because your brain, it doesn't know anything about the environment, only like what commands it's give, you're giving it. Well, yeah, but hmm, how do you do self-balancing then? You're, you, you stand on it, right? No, 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 I don't mean hoverboard now, just do a two-wheel self-balancing robot. Oh, you mean, okay. Well, where, does, yeah. where does that decision-making go? And how much of it is in the motor driver versus how much of it is above the motor oh, driver? Oh, I see what you're saying is that, that okay, we, so we recreate the brain at one level. Functional then, decomposition, yes. And then what do you call it? Functional decomposition. Which yes. elements of the design get which responsibility? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so now, if the more you push down into the driver that's practical to push down the driver, not excessive, that's practical, the easier in some ways it is to create upper level applications. Yes. Likewise, if you push too much down, it becomes harder to create. Then you, go, you wind up in a box then. And yes, trying exactly. Trying to compensate for the limitations of the box, box at the higher Correct. level. Correct. And so thinking about the boundary of your driver, how much do you put in it? How much do you not put in it? We know at least now that you have position control coming in and you have sensory data coming out and you need to be the, need the ability to reset the sensory data, the accumulator. And so now we know that, but there's probably more you could do if you begin to think about self-balancing 
or if you begin to. And so what is the next layer? And so that's how I would answer those questions for myself is I begin to redraw that boundary and which functional responsibilities do I want in there? Yes. And that's yes. why I say go to the first level implementation. Um, one of my projects when I first got into Hewlett Packard was uh, developing a rewritable optical drive using lasers, lasers and magnetics and full operating system and everything else. Our team went into exploratory conversations for months on how to configure the elements of the drive and which had which responsibility. And the managers would question us, why are you going so far into these discussions? And it was because we were discussing where the boundaries should be and thinking through first implementations to make sure the boundaries were correct, right? And so this is why I'm saying first implementations of the self-balancing, first implementations of Hover, first implementation of Ken's guided basic platform, and then first implementation of adding a sensor, all teach you something about what should be inside the driver versus outside of the driver, because they all have different problems. I, yeah, agree, with, yeah. I agree with all of that. It's important to know where the where it makes sense to draw the boundaries because if you try and put too much in low level, then it becomes difficult to use for other purposes. Yep, yep, yeah. I call this functional decomposition is a smart term. I always call it where to cut the pie. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Even in debugging, you have to go. Oh, got a problem. Well, where do you cut the pie to, to cut the problem in half? That's a hard thing to figure out. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Subdividing things. Yeah, but it's always the decision between how much do you put in firmware, how much do you put in hardware, right? How right. much in U6, how much in the upper level software. And this, this decision is always there. And so it's the same thing when trying to come up with new capabilities now for your software driver. It's just, what do you want? And that's the way I heard your question when you first asked it. What do we need, yeah, yeah. The, driver, what do we need the driver to do, right? Yeah, it makes me think that I mean, there, there are at least two fundamental driver approaches. One is the hoverboard approach where you're relying on some higher level feedback to guide the motion. And then there's the, the, the time-based and you know, where, uh, movement planning. I think they call this, I think that uh, Alan Bradley calls this a movement plan. You know, So they'll come up with a movement plan that might involve 10 servos mm -hmm. and then they'll execute it. Everything's in, in, in uh, working in a coordinated way. If you, th if you think about the example of a, a, a six axis arm, for instance, um, do you move each of the servers independently or do you set them all in motion at the same time? And do you control rate to make that motion smooth? Do you, you know, right. how natural is it based on rates? What kind of curves do you want for each to make it look more natural? Um, all sorts of things. And we that's had, all in the movement planning or motion planning, however you call it. Yeah. And see, the thing about making some kind of simplistic higher level driver that's like go from A to B in this time is that you don't always want to wind up stopped at the beginning and the end. You might want, you have basically what are like waypoints. Like, okay, I'm going to give you a command to go from here to here and change the speed by this much. But then when we're done with that command, we have all this inertia. We're not stopped, right? So we have to now yeah. give we have to feed it another command like, okay, now start to do this and, and transition to this scheme over this much time. And then that command's done. Who's thrown sensors off their arms because of not paying attention to inertia? <laughs> Oopsie. Can I say that again? I said, who's thrown sensors off of moving mechanisms because of not paying attention to inertia and, and oh. how fast you can break? Um, in the optical drives, we threw lenses off of the, because of over 10 G accelerations off of the arms uh, and had to choose glues and things that could handle that. And so I see. It's been crazy. Chip, yeah. I think that Michael has a couple of these motors set up on his bench. And we also, yeah. we also have a number of comments in chat. Has anyone been, been following that? A lot of CNC discussion. Yeah, people are getting their plans together. So the question was robots or CNC? And, and I replied, well, robots, because we have the hardware. But definitely, if somebody produced a CNC application that were a commercial product with the P1 or P2, that would be wonderful. It's been needed for many years. <clears throat> so Michael, are you still out there? OK, 
Okay, if we, if we awake him. Yeah, uh, he, oh, a couple minutes. Okay, sure. So Chip, is it less clear or more clear now on where to go with the driver? <laughs> well, more clear. It's good to talk about it because I don't, at some point I kind of wind up blocked in my thinking. Like, I don't know where to think next. Well, but I think we need to give it, you a platform that can roll around for starters. Right. And I'm thinking that from our discussion, that has to be vector controlled, but it has to accumulate in Cartesian terms where it's at. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, I assume Colin knows what that meant. <laughs> uh, yep. Okay. So we need to get you a platform because we put out all this amazing hardware and yeah, my concern is people see it and they're going to think it's like something as easy to control as they're used to with small robots and we're far from that at this time. So we got to work towards the uh, high level part with the driver. I wonder if Michael could show us the hoverboard wheel. We got that thing going so fast. He had a um, RPM thing on it, but I think I talked about that last time. The motor faulted and, it, and I had it, so it was grounding all the terminals afterwards. And the inertia just ripped it right out of his vice and broke everything. He broke a P2 eval board and then, because uh, everything got whipped off the table and then. I think the uh, USB connector came off it. So he's got these window motors. What do we call them, Ken? 12 volt motor mount and wheel kit motors, DC gear motors from, yeah, Windows. Yeah, 1992 uh, Toyota something. These things here, right? Yep. So they have. Oh, you, oh you, mean, you mean actual Windows, not Microsoft Windows, but That's correct. car Windows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah, for lack is. of clarity. Worm gear here, rotary gear. So it's high torque, like a DC motor. You know, you can run both two directions <clears throat> and then real high torque right here to move the window arm up and down. Yeah, what Chip is actually showing. So we have two uses of this product eventually. And one of them is um, this is a very popular hardware set that we've made for years. And in fact, these are milled just over Chip's left shoulder right now in Red Bluff. It's a bunch of parts, but they're using these, you know, fairly clunky DC gear motors with um, some backlash. And there's an encoder system in it, very low resolution. It's an optical encoder. And this motor driver controls these, this system, which are like these 120 RPM motors. Um, and they're quiet. They're nice. They work great on robots, as well as the new system the hub motors. And I, I'm interested in the hub motors because of the, the speed and the power and the feedback. And we have, we, there are two different types of these motors then, right? Because they're mirrors of each other. Yeah, there's a left and a right. And then we make that bearing block. But it's funny, all these pieces, we've basically are yeah, fully eliminated. Block. That hub motor gets rid of all this stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's less cost to the user. Yeah. I'll hook up, okay, I'll hook up my big hub motor here. Hey, one thing, well, while Michael's getting ready, I wanted to show you guys, you understand that uh, these motors that have Hall effect feedback, one revolution of the three wire AC, if you wanna call it that, is a partial revolution of the whole wheel always, right? So in the case of this big one we got here, it's like there are 24 times, I know 15 times six is 90 steps in a revolution. So it's one fifteenth of a turn. Um, but here's the funny thing. There's all these, these things, I guess you could look, think of them as many, many, many in a circle, right? And we're monitoring the Hall effect sensors monitor, I don't know, some kind of offset thing like this as they go around. Well, the thing is every motor, I mean, every model, every different motor model has these things at slightly different registrations. You know, if you get U, V, and W on your drive lined up and you get U, V, and W on your um, Hall effect sensor wired up right, there is still this, this funny offset thing that needs to be compensated for so that you don't like take way more power to run the motor one direction than you do another. 
And so but is that something level, that anybody would know or care about at a high level? I just I just saw that I was running the motor again. I saw that I'm watching the power level. So it goes, then it turns around. It goes, it's like, wow, why is the why is there such a power difference? So I added this little tweak thing. Let me just show this real quick again. Just a few instructions here, right here. Okay, you see this? Rate is a signed number, right? That's the rate of change for the angle for the three phase output. So that's, you can think of rate as, as, uh, as frequency. So this, the top bit of rate is gonna be the, the direction of movement, right? So I, I, I got it here because I needed that bit here for the lookup, which happens here, but then we also use that bit here. So if you're going forward or reverse, it helps to add when the, well, I found to subtract one constant or another based on what direction you're turning. So this is like, you can see the difference between these two is 30. 30 fraction of 300 is one tenth. So there's like one tenth of a res, revolution, three phase revolution difference between what you need to, how you need to work it going forward versus work it going in reverse. Is, so, there a way, is there a way to detect this and maybe compensate for it? Or is this just literally trial and error and type in numbers? And I did it trial and error. I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to go, you'd, you'd have to be able to have the motor freewheel. I mean, you know, be able to turn freely and you, you'd have to like run it at a, uh, a certain, you know, fix the frequency, right? Run it at a frequency. So it's turning at a certain rate and then tweak these numbers until it's like, it has to be like an autofocus camera until it kind of like seeks out, like where's the sweet spot where I'm, I'm my power is lowest and I'm maintaining my rate. Uh, Chip, is this something to, if you lifted the wheel off of the surface during a calibration period where you could actually run it forward and backward and detect those values and then use those values after detected? That's how you have to do it. You have to have the motor unloaded, mechanically right. unloaded. And then you have to just, because if, if you're off, if you don't make this compensation, your phase relationship isn't correct relative to the Hall effect sensors. Right. So you're forever gonna be like, you know, having to overdrive it because you're inefficient going one direction. Yeah, and, then, and you might be off in both directions. I mean. For the hoverboard motor, none of this compensation seemed necessary. But when I got this little motor working, it's like, wow, why is there such a difference? And I was trying to figure out where to address it. And I figured right here, I can just take the error before I subtract it from the angle. Well, once, once we do this, we have the error. This is just a variable called error, right? right. But what, what this is, is this is the looked up Hall effect angle right here. And so when you look up the Hall effect angle, depending on which way you're driving the motor, you add or you subtract one value or another, then you subtract it from your power angle, then you have like an, a balanced error. Yeah, my reason for asking is it sounds like, um, you've achieved a level of understanding of the relationship between uh, control and sense that can be unique to at least the, brand of motor may be instance to instance of each It motor. could even be instance to instance. I mean, I and therefore you could encode the science and your understanding in the driver by creating cow routines that make the best yeah. for the individual motor. And that seems to me how to bring the best possible your understanding to our community, right? Is, is you create those kind of routines for us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Um, I mean, it's pretty simple in practice. You just run the motor at some viable rate, and then you, you tweak these phase values effectively until you find the optimal one for going each direction. And right. so what you're going to do is fix like, the power to go to a low. It doesn't sound like something like uh, uh, a user that wants to have the best performance but doesn't want to pay attention to motor details would be wanting to do. Well, if you don't if you don't compensate for this, you're not going to get as much power out of your motor, and you're going to waste battery. Correct, correct. So it sounds like an intelligent uh, uh, a driver that you want to deliver 
should have like calibration routines that I can do this yeah. kind of thing and then record an EEPROM or at least offer up through display something that we can put in the code. Yeah, and once once those values get determined, they don't change. I mean, it's it because it has to do with the physical configuration of the motor right. for the given motor. They don't change. For so it's the a given motor, lives, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a value that lives with the motor. And that yeah. given motor is that hoverboard motor. Start with those. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I need to do this compensation for the hoverboard, but it was kind of like out of the box. It seemed to work, but this little gear motor had like, I mean it needs to be basically a third off, you know, around a third off from the Hall effect sensor. Uh, you have a question in, in chat, Chip. Let's uh, see. Let me stop sharing. And then we got to get back to Michael too. Yeah, I know. It's Michael, very late where he is. It's after midnight. He, he didn't know <laughs> that until yes. he went to the clock. <laughs> Wait, it is? <laughs> that was good. So want to go to Michael or what was the question? Stephen? It's about that. You see, Joseph Stewart is asking, maybe a dumb observation, but regarding the error 110 versus the 80, could this be an effective measurement of the magnet used for the Hall effect sensor? Could uh, be. Yeah, I mean, certainly the strength of the magnet will determine how close it has to be before the Hall effect triggers. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what, also, it could, as that motor turns around, you could have many subtle variations in these values. But what I did is I ran the motor for a while so, and, and, and watched it. So I was getting an average. Like what's the best configuration for the average of the whole motor? Right, because yeah, you have a number of, number of hull sensed positions, right? Yeah, but remember there are so you're 15, averaging, 15, you're averaging positions, okay. There are 15 hull revolutions per one wheel revolution. Jeez. So it's totally likely that, I mean, there's gonna be some kind of, whether it's worth compensating for is arguable, but there is always going to be a little bit of difference. Sure. From okay. Within one revolution. Chip, let's see what Michael's got going on. Michael, are you still with us? Yeah. Can I just jump this, dump a screen share? Yep. Oh, good job. You got that together in the last couple of hours, even. Jeez. Yeah. So that was, um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's, there's a, that's the 2012 robot and that's the 2022 robot. <laughs> mm. um, but anyway, the point was just to, just to put something together, just to demonstrate for customers, you know, how, how simple it is to build, or at least one way of putting things together. And there's two examples here. One's, uh, you know, in shop now is, is, for customers who've got the Arlo platform and, and might be interested in updating it, then it just demonstrates that the, the Arlo switch, the power distribution thing actually has the right voltages for running the P2H straight away. So um, I've taken off the two existing boards that were on there, the old motor controller and the old um, propeller activity board. And the Johnny Mac just sits there nicely. Um, Sorry, it's not very well focused. This camera is not really meant for this sort of thing, but I think you can see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, the edge module, of course, and a Wi-Fi, and a great big battery hidden underneath. So if I power that on, um, what we made is a little, uh, a little simple telnet interface. So over Wi-Fi, we can just drive the thing around with some simple, oops, cross connections. You can just drive the thing around with some simple commands, which is good for us testing. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. We can go left, oh. go left, and go right. Well, that's not a command, but uh, oh, I've still spelt it wrong. Yeah, slow is down. Go space left. Oh, oh, you can use commas or spaces as delimiters. Doesn't matter. But I'm just not to uh, uh, go right. Two hundred ten. Anyway, uh, the, the, I mean, this, the command that we just had set up there is um, it's speed, comma, um, or speed, space. What's the next digit? Oh, ticks. How long it goes for? Hey. So <clears throat> we've just been using that for testing, but it's just, it's just nice to show, I thought, that it's, it, it works really well with the Wi-Fi connection on the Johnny Mac board 
And um, yeah, five volts tacked off the Arlo power distribution board there to run the edge module and the Wi-Fi module and the motor controller there um, running the wheels. So that's that's quite a neat little little platform. And we'll certainly share this code. Can you sure. do a tank turn with that? Like pin it on the spot? What, sorry? A tank, tank turn. turn, like right wheel, right right wheel forward, left wheel back. Just um, yeah, it's yeah, that. you can do that. Yeah, it definitely can. I haven't coded it in, of course. Um, but yeah, I can add that in a minute. Um, you know, the code, the code, yeah, we can we can just extend the code for anything really. I just quickly wrote this kind of um, you know command parser interface so that we can just send commands over telnet or um, uh, you know, uh, parallax serial terminal. That's the other way of doing it, just the traditional way using that thing. Um, if you want to plug a prop plug in, um, and the commands are just whatever we want, really, just a whole bunch of commands. If it's stop, start, rate. I started added the, adding the commands for the, um, the new, you know, the hub wheels, which are set by rate. Um, but yeah, various things. We can toggle, toggle echo on and off and stuff if we don't want to have you know, the echo commands coming in and uh, all that sort of good stuff. Yeah, so. And just PWM, right? Not, no um, feedback from the encoders, right? Uh, the, so it's reading the encoder ticks for distance with this command. So 50 oh. is the amount of ticks it will, um, it will go, go a bit faster. Uh, although it might have a, I added a timeout actually earlier, and I think it's still got that on there. It counts the ticks or it times out um, because I kept hitting the wall while I was testing various things. <laughs> Super. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it doesn't need to have the, the sort of timeout on there. Um, but that's, you know, it's a ready to go, easy, easy interface. So we'll definitely share the code um, up on the website. I think the motor controllers are going to be up soon and everything else is in stock. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty much as Ken's already shown in his diagram. Um, and then the other, the other motor, which Chip mentioned earlier that we had going at 30 miles an hour, 50 kilometers, no, how was that? 50 miles an hour, 30 kilometers an hour, something like that. Um, <laughs> this thing, uh, yeah, which managed to completely destroy our P2 eval board, unfortunately. Um, yeah, these are great fun, the hoverboard motors and wheels. They're super fast. Um, and this is just, I wonder if I can get some focus on that just to show how that feels a bit better. But anyway, so that's using the mini breakout board in the middle there, which of course you could also do on this previous robot. Um, I think it's quite nice having the breadboard if you want to add extra things. And I think also the Johnny Mac's good because it's got the servo headers. So if we want to add um, I was thinking originally of adding some ping sensors on here, much like the original build instructions are, um, but I just didn't get, get to that. But with the Johnny Mac board, you know, it's got the servo header, so it kind of makes that easy to do. Um, you know, that's sort of in what with Stephen was thinking earlier about adding other sensors to detect, um, you know, obstacles and things. Um, but yeah, you could also make it just with the simple breakout because that's got two dual headers either side. Um, so for the hub wheels, that works quite well as well. Um, yeah, I can't really show that one running, unfortunately, but next week we'll have that one running around. I'm just trying to think how we can demonstrate that really, because it does go so fast. Such a small little snapshot in my office doesn't do it justice, but maybe, you'll, maybe we'll put something outside in the yard and have it zooming up and down or something. Well, the entire parallax front office is empty now, so I'd like to see this zipping 30 miles an hour, but avoiding <laughs> the glass walls. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a, it's, a, it's a monster, it really goes. Well, you so, solved one of our needs, though. The DC gear motors now, you have some kind of control for that and some spin code, and that's a need. Yeah. Because we had no motor controller. Um, the DHP10 was the last thing we had, and, of course, that went out of stock a year and a half ago. Yeah. So now we have a system using the P2 for that. That's good. Yeah. And I'll, 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 um, I'll get this code shared up in the next day or two, once Chip's polished off his, uh, 
his update his update to the driver. Um, yeah, we'll get that in there. And there'll be there's there'll be one or two quick bites. Well, there'll be certainly two quick bites coming up. One will be showing the build instructions on the Arlo um, upgrade to P2, and the other one will be the um, you know the hub wheel platform. Uh, and all the you know all the code and all the steps so it just makes it easy to give people a kind of platform to get right. started with and you don't need the wi-fi module if you want to if you uh you know if you want to run a usb prop hub connection you can do it through uh the same commands run through serial terminal as well well as we move chip in this direction with the platform he's going to need this because we'll need to see it on the ground at some point and you can't have a 50-foot cable <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super fun for testing. That's for sure. What is that base made of? That white base? Cutting board, huh? Oh, that's just um, some. Um, we call it habosh. It's kind of a. Um, I don't know. It's white fiber board. Oh, okay, okay. This is something you made, Michael. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's just. It's just. It's just. Um, just a sheet, a sheet of wood or a sheet of anything will do really. It's just cut out that way with the, the spinny wheel on the front. We're out of the camera range. Yep. How about that? There you go. Better, better. Okay, so you got those new motor mounts. Yeah. So we've got the spinny, uh, the spinny caster wheel at the front and then the two motor mounts at the back there, yeah. And what you could do additionally is use the bottom of the wheel motor mounts and put a little tray in there and put a lipo battery between the motors. Yeah, this thing's a bit uh, a bit serious. <laughs> That's cool. But it's good for testing, super long life. Yeah. Yeah. And then what is the white element right in front of the battery? Oh, that's the fuse. Okay. Oh, it's like a little breaker. Yeah, we had a household breaker. I think it's a 20 amp. It's just super convenient for testing because of the switch. I do like there to be a switch in easy reach in case things start melting down. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, we were we were driving this, uh, we were driving the hub wheels the other day at 60 volts, three amps, and uh, things were quite cool. But at that sort of voltage, it's nice to have a it's nice to have a quick safety cutout. But then we switched over to the other power supply and we were running, uh, oh, I can't remember what it peaked to, but it's, uh, it was 12 volts. There's a 40 amp supply, but I think we were doing 20, 25 amps or something. We were uh, driving them at 12 volts. And that such high amperage is definitely nice to have a, a cutout switch <laughs> if things start getting hot. But everything survived. The boards were, um, and we were yanking the motors back and forth. No damage to the driver boards. We did manage to melt one of the uh, terminal block connectors, which was quite fun. It was maybe still here. None of the solid state stuff got hot, got that hot at all. Yeah, the board remains nice and cool. We just melted down the uh, the connector between the between the motor wires on the where we made an extension cable. Um, that's actually a really good point as well. If people are going to make their own hub motor um, uh, robot, then it's a really good idea to um, to kind of figure out where the motor wires are going to reach to. So that's what we did here with this layout. So we've made the, uh, although to be fair, the, 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 the angle cut out the front didn't really go well with this battery. That was kind of a last minute choice to slap this big battery on because we run out of juice. Um, uh, it's neater with a smaller battery pack there. Um, but the definitely the distance between the wheels and the spring terminals for the wires is worth looking at before you start cutting wood or cutting material for your base because it's really nice not to have to extend the cables. And they're quite short, the cables on these motor wheels. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's, that's definitely worth doing before you build the whole thing, have it all nicely drilled and stuff, and then realize, oh, heck, the wires don't reach. Um, 
Yeah. So in the, I mean, in this configuration, they do reach without extension. So it is, it is possible. Um, and so you just need to think about the width of the lay it all out on a car. We, we laid it all out on a cardboard te uh, template before we started cutting things just to make but sure. Auto helps you with that. Yeah. 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 When I say we, I mean, Otto did. <laughs> <laughs> I was a mere spectator. <laughs> Putting in my two penneth along the way. And that was about that. Well, that's kind of how it has to be done. Those motor leads are so short that it's a good thing that that, uh, that little breakout board has connectors on both sides of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect to get them right where, right where they want to be. Um, we actually drilled it out originally for a Johnny Mac board. Um, and that sits, that sits nicely there as well. Um, but you definitely want to have a slightly wider platform if you're running the Johnny Mac board. Yeah. Um, because just because of the width of the thing. Because otherwise, what will happen, I don't know if this is in camera view still, is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is just about. Yeah. So I think um, maybe that weighs the logical orientation because it's possible, it might be nice to have the power switch within reach. Um, you, you can't do maybe. it that way because you're, you're hitting the uh, boot pins. Yeah, you can't do that. You're right. So it has to go that way. Maybe that's nice now because the edge module is protected. It's not at the edge of the <laughs> edge of the robot. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that could go there, and obviously the power lead could reach there. Problem is that because of the extra width of the board, um, these motor cables won't reach. Oh. So I wouldn't be able to plug those in. Um, they just won't fit at all. So I'd have to make the base wider for the Johnny Mac board. Put move the wheels out a little bit more. So that the cables would reach. So yeah, it definitely needs um, needs a little bit of thought when you lay out the base. But yeah, definitely good. I think not to have to extend the um, cables. Yeah, yeah, they would. That good work there, Michael. So <laughs> before we move on to anything um, non-motor control, let's just see if anybody has any other feedback for for Chip here working on firmware or for Michael because we still have to progress this towards a, a useful interface for people. I guess everyone kind of likes what they've seen except um, steppers are a request and um, CNC applications are of interest to many, at least who are here today. I don't know if steppers require anything specific. I, I built a stepper system um, based on a P1 just with some Pololu uh, stepper drivers. Um, and the, the programming was actually pretty straightforward. So I don't yep. know if we need specific support for that. Agreed. Uh, let's see, Bill said, seems like the motor controller needs to reference zero cross as an error test. What do you mean? So, Mr. What is what would be the zero cross? You can type, Bill, if you if you if your microphone's not running. And while you sort that out, are there other topics of interest to people today? Support questions for Chip, uh, requests of any kind for either of us. Because I'll cut the recording here in just a second, and then we can have that discussion too. Okay, I'm just going to stop the recording, Chip.